Good afternoon and welcome to this presentation, our a 2 l Refrigerants Elevating In-Room HVC Solutions. This event, brought to you by the ACHR News, is sponsored by Friedrich Air Conditioning. I'm your moderator, Kyle Gargaro, Editorial Director of the ACHR News. Thanks for joining us. Today's presenters are from Friedrich. They are TJ Wheeler, Senior Director of Sales and Marketing, Jared Adams, Senior Manager of Product Management, and Bill Huber, Senior Manager of National Accounts. Everyone's a senior. It means we're going to know our stuff today, right? We're going to know. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, stay tuned at the end of the presentation. We'll, we'll address a, a few questions to the panel. But I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you guys and, and start educating us, please. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, TJ, this is our fifth year, fifth year. I think, at, yeah. uh, live here at uh, AHR Expo. A little bit different format this year. Yeah. Normally, we're in we're front of a monitor doing a webinar. And we're sitting. And this year, we're sitting. We're sitting, yeah. Yeah, this, this year, we're sitting. Uh, also joined with special guest Bill Huber from Friedrich as well. So excited to be here. would like to thank uh, BPN Media for allowing us the opportunity. Uh, but excited to talk today, Kyle, about A2Ls. Uh, I think it's uh, definitely a theme that we're seeing throughout the expo. A lot of questions, a lot of concerns from people coming into our booth, and uh, I thought we'd do a deep dive with that today, yeah. TJ. Yeah, and, and talk a little bit more about some of the non-traditional topics around it, too. Some, some things around, um, you know, obviously we're talking about the regulations and things that are changing, but um, in you know, Friedrich, we, man we manufacture a lot of packaged products, and there's some differences between the traditional unitary A2L requirements and rules and regulations and those of the packaged products. We want to kind of dig into that, um, and it's not just a product thing. It's not a manufacturing thing. It's some of its distribution, some of its application and installation. Um, so there's a lot of there's there's a lot of things to, to really um, to absorb, digest, and plan for um, that, that may not be obvious. So we want to make sure, we want to try to touch on that and, and maybe talk about a few things that, that really haven't been brought up yet that a lot of folks may not be be um, be aware of yet. So yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, topics are kind of broad based. Uh, some of the things that we're hearing on our booth you see on the slide here, but you know um, what are the EPA requirements for sell through? Yeah. for existing R410A products. I think that's an important topic to understand. A lot of concerns about A2L refrigerant safety uh, and, and how Friedrich is uh, adopting A2Ls into our product line and what that's going to do for in-room HVAC solutions yeah. moving forward. Yeah, which gets into some of the other topics like the, uh, the local code adoptions. Um, so there's you know around eight, not only A2Ls, but also changing codes that are going to impact different product categories and, you know, um, Bill represents a lot of our lodging business, and there's some, you know, some big changes ahead for us. Yeah, there really is, and a lot of our customers and, and you know, clients in general are asking questions to us as the manufacturers to be the expert, you know, to help educate them in, the, in what it means to them, what it means to the building, you know, environment, and what it means, in, in fact, for to their guests or to their tenants. And so, um, it's an important, you know, important role as a manufacturer to be able to, to discuss those things. Yeah, yeah, good, and we, uh, you know, they're they're. While um, I don't think the construction of, of properties like like lodging are going to change, you know, wholesale, but I think there um, I think there are some things that they, that people can start planning for in the design and development stage um, to, to really help um, avoid pitfalls or, or maybe slowdowns or hangups, you know, in the commissioning process and opening. Yeah. Um, right, and, and A2L refrigerators really do kind of change the environment of the building itself in terms of what can happen. You know, if things you know do terminate within refrigerant and within equipment like ours sure. and, and other manufacturers, so it's important to be well educated and to really know what the impacts are and the different products and applications that can go into that and affect you know the overall building and, and performance. So, yeah, yeah uh, TJ, Bill, uh, I know you guys kind of lead our sales initiatives uh, at Friedrich. From the traffic in the booth, particularly from the hospitality, lodging, multifamily sectors. A lot of questions and concerns about cost and the cost impact mm -hmm. from from the customer base while we're here. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually a, a, a pretty good question, especially on the building developers and owners and operators as well, right? As as manufacturers, we kind of understand it from that product cost piece, but what are they going to see in their building envelope when they get to the whole thing? And um, and it's it is and like like a lot of things around A2Ls, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, you know, there there are some differences. So that, you know, with um, with certain products, you have uh, refrigerant uh, capacity limits or, or, or requirements where I, uh, you know above sixty four ounces of, of refrigerant, you must have sense safety sensors involved, and those sensors cost money. Yeah. So those so products that are larger products have an additional cost burden above just the A two L itself. Sure. Um, you know, and then other things as well. So not not only in the design and construction phase, but also in the manufacturing. Yeah, and I phase think we well. We're, we'll talk about that as we get into the webinar yeah. here. But you know, I wanted to kick off, Bill, particularly you calling on national accounts. Are they are they coming to you looking for feedback about the impact in Absolutely. design? 
Yeah, for sure, and, and it's, it's a couple different things. One, the refrigerant seems to have come ahead of the building codes, and yeah. so you know it's it's almost kind of reverse of what it of what it should be, and so you know how that impacts what it is you know there, there's one thing having a two-story apartment complex and multifamily, but it's another story you know having a ten or twelve-story multifamily facility, mm -hmm. or you know a, a, a two-story limited service hotel is much different than a twenty-story full service hotel. And so there's different equipment and different, uh, you know, variables that go into the selection of our, our type of equipment. And, uh, so, and so it all is very impactful. So, yeah, they're asking us quite frankly, quite frequently about how that all impacts them and, and, and their buildings and in their brands. Absolutely. Yeah. Should we dig in? Let's dig in. Yeah. Great, great topic. I think uh, this should be a fun discussion. So let's, let's dig in. First and foremost, TJ, maybe right out of the gate, talk to us a little bit about what's the sell-through look like, R410A versus... Yeah. 32 or 454. So, you know, we, as an industry, we were all pretty happy with the EPA's decision to allow a one-year sell-through of, of, of most product categories. So that that was a, a really big, um, not not really just a win for the industry, but really for, for consumers um, and the entire supply chain, um, you know, all the way from the consumer up to the manufacturer as well. It was the, you know, the right thing. So uh, from a cost and an inventory and, and a changeover perspective, and not stranding a lot of inventory as well. But there are some nuances to it. There are some differences. It's not just cut and dry one year sell through every type of product. And I think that's one of the things that we wanted to kick kick off with. Um, you know, what are those differences and how are they are they are they separated by different product categories? And we've got oh, thanks for putting the slide up. Um, but you can see we, you know, we, with with the product categories that Friedrich offers, um, there are actually four different segments of sell through dates building build out dates um, and, and sell through dates for for um, manufacturers as well as distributors so Jerry, yeah, and, I, and I, I think it's a little the relevancy is it's on us uh, from implementation into the product line but also uh, with distribution as well as the customer base uh, at, at the end all through the cycle we're all impacted uh, so we, we've been working very hard on the product management side of Friedrich to make sure that we're uh, far enough ahead of the curve to make sure that we have products specific uh, to each one of the verticals, but also making sure that we're all just ready to go one one twenty five with uh, with A two O refrigerant. Yeah. So, um, you know, we can start here talking a little bit about ductless. Um, certainly, this year uh, in ductless mini and multi split, we have the capabilities to continue uh, building and sell it, uh, selling and installing uh, mini and multi split with our four ten A. We're going to continue to do that, and as we move forward in twenty twenty five, after the cutoff date of one one twenty five. Uh, we'll be able to sell some R410A ductless as components. Components. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll label those individual indoor and outdoor as components, enabling us to still continue to take care of uh, the replacement market R410A throughout the U.S. And then I think we have a new product line, TJ. Yeah, from, we, uh, we do. Universal we, heat pump. Yeah, we, we just launched a product. We've, we've called it the Breeze, which is a low temp side discharge heat pump unit, a great way to decarbonize, which is a, could be a whole other topic for it. I think we talked a lot about that last year. Yeah, that was our um, last year topic. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but, but that, that product line, like unitary products, has a traditional um, one-year sell-through as a system but an indefinite sell-through as a component because many of these, as you know, have um, high side only um, change-out requirements. You often have, you know, if, if, it's, if it's not, it's very uncommon to have a total system failure. You'd oftentimes have a component failure of the a indoor or outdoor failure, some, warranty sometimes. failure. And those will be able to be sold through indefinitely. Yeah. Um, so, that, so that's great. And one, one of the things we should probably set up is we, when we think about the, the changeover dates, if you will, for A2S, we think about it in two segments. One, how long can I keep building it as a manufacturer? Two, how long can it be sold and then installed? So that could be from the distributor to the contractor and then the contractor obviously doing the installation because those do, those do um, change. So um, ductless as components, as you mentioned, can, can be sold through, as, uh, but, but not as a system. Similarly, for universal heat pumps and unitary products in general, um, but as components, they can be sold through indefinitely. So there's really not a lot of, a, of an inventory risk there for the replacement market piece. Yeah. Um, TJ, how long do you think that we'll have the ability to continue to produce our 410A as components? Any indication yet? You know, I you know it'll it'll, it'll probably happen a lot like the R22 and R410 changeover, where yeah. the cost of refrigerant will be will start to become prohibitive. Um, you know, so as that price starts to shift, which you know I think will probably, if I had to crystal ball it, I would say it's something in you know the two to three or four year range. Yeah. Um, but you know, again, depending on the demand, we'll be we'll have the ability to continue building. The great thing with this change is that um, you know we because of the efficiency changes of, of recent years, a lot of us have already changed our platforms, and yeah. we don't have to rethink the platform again 
for A2Ls only. So that's going to be great. We don't have as much changeover in physical tooling, but there is the entire there is the system development. So every manufacturer here is is having you know, an, an amazing undertaking of converting from the. Um, from R410 and others to the A2L, so. Yeah, and I think when we continue on through the, the uh, product categories that we manufacture, uh, as we look at room air, rack, uh, portable air, and uh, pack, package terminal, PTAC, um, it's not all doom and gloom, right? Nope. So uh, while we produce uh, R410A products uh, exclusively today in these categories, throughout this year, Bill, particularly for your customers, uh, we'll be introducing R32 uh, package terminal, and we were blessed a little bit with the EPA regulation to give us a three-year sell-through window for pack rack and, uh, and dehumidification. Yeah, and that was great, and they made that clear very early on in the process, too, so we yeah. were very fortunate with that. And then, again, what that means for, for, for uh, Friedrich and our customers um, and, and end users is there there's not a inventory risk in that, to have that three-year sell-through. That's a, that's a good long window, and again, we appreciate the EPA for, for making that announcement early um, and giving us time, and giving yeah. us time, yeah. yeah, and I think there's some, a little appreciation too. I, I direct feedback that we've been receiving from customers. We have some customers that want to continue to to build and install R410A, but we have some early adopters too. I think California and Washington kind of leading that right initiative, coast, yeah. but we're you still know, seeing it throughout. Not to jump in on that, but what's interesting is when you had the initial transition from R22 to 410. People were kind of reluctant to make that change. It was a whole different, you know, redesign. But with with kind of the big buzz of what's going on with this new refrigerant and being mildly flammable, it seems as though the marketplace is taking a hold of that change and accepting it as well. We have yeah. some customers that are actually already asking for R32 products. It's very encouraging um, as, we, as an industry, great, yeah. right? And, and I think we're going to see more adoption of that. Certainly, as TJ talked about, the phase in and phase out and how long 410 will be available. I think most of these customers are saying, hey, look, if this is our refrigerant for the future, let's just start putting it in our buildings today and then we not have to worry so about they're, that. So they're ready to go. Out. The demand exactly. is there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. that's exciting. It doesn't seem to be the reluctance. That's, a, yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah, and then I think last on the list, as far as the verticals that we're building for, VPAC and variable refrigerant products. So, TJ, you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Well, that's a, again, it's a pack, package piece of equipment, Indeed. so very similar to a PTAC or a window air conditioner. Um, because it's a factory assembled, complete package ready to commission, um, it also has the same three year sell through. Yeah, and with the with the three year sell through, uh, is the Friedrich thought process on the introduction of the A2Ls extended, or is that something that we're going to continue to expedite to potentially meet the demand that Bill's speaking about? Yeah, I think uh, you know on, on all of these product categories, we're we're really embracing this opportunity and we're we're, we're bringing product to market as quickly as possible um, and giving our customers the the, the choice of the A2L or the 410A product throughout this throughout 2024. Um, to let them help you know, make the decision, um, you know, convert properties or, convert, or or keep them the same. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the name of the game is we're prepared, we're ready. There's a lot of skews, a lot of change for the industry, a lot of change for our sales team uh, to adopt, but really uh, some uh, adoption time to understand at the customer level too to understand what they should be putting in and when. Yeah, and we were, we're also, you know, Friedrich's also fortunate. You know, we, we launched our first um, A2L products in 2014. We've actually sold over a million um, R32 window air conditioners. I, I, think that's that a, I think that's a statistic that's lost yeah. on a lot of people as yeah. we talk about A2Ls. I mean, we've, we've been doing it a long time. We've yeah. proven the safety, particularly in room air applications. Yeah. Oh. All right, let's get to our uh, did you know. I, I like this slide. Uh, something that uh, has been talked about a lot, at least internally at the manufacturing level. But ASHRAE 15 uh, 2019, as well as International Mechanical Code Chapter 11, TJ, specifically states that when using A2L refrigerants uh, installed in multi-floor buildings, um, that the, the line sets have to be installed in fire-rated single chase. Uh, that's different than what we do today. Very different. What's that impact, Bill, TJ, on our our customer base specifically? Well, it's that's a pretty big deal. If you think about having, you know, in a non-packaged equipment where you have line sets that are, you know, going from a condenser to an evaporator, in larger applications, you're going to have a great number of line sets going through that building. If you think it fit from being a condenser and then maybe two or three hundred evaporators as line sets going there. And within those line sets is refrigerant, right? And now with that refrigerant, you're having what they you know, consider we're talking about is a mildly flammable refrigerant. So um, 
each one of those line sets having uh, being have to have a single use or be insulated completely changes the dynamic of how you build a building. Mm. Now you have to have a place for all of those line sets and a place for all those fire rated yeah. chases. And you have to have a building that's designed around it. And, and so that really changes the game and, and the type of equipment that's selected, uh, you know, the, how the contractors put it in, the cost associated with doing that, of you know, building that chase, of putting those in a fire rated um, you know, uh, chases. So it's a real game changer and it's something that's it's very new and it's something that people are really concerned about, especially once you get to the multi-story buildings. Um, yeah. Again, cost goes up, labor goes up, uh, you know, that everything kind of goes up with that whole process. Yeah, so Bill, the, Bill, the visual I have in my head when I when I think about this is I see that four-story multifamily building. I, I see the split farm with the condensers up on the roof. Today, traditional construction would be all those line sets really coming into, what, a central mechanical chase? Yeah. And then going to the floor. So now mm -hmm. you're telling me that each one of those line sets has to have their own yeah. mechanical chase. I, I think this is probably one of the biggest codes and he did a great job with the do you know piece because I don't think a lot of I don't think this has uh, been been absorbed by a lot of people yet um, you know because a2ls are still kind of new but when you think about the, the planning and the property and the, the, the development this it's now when they when people need to be considering this right it, it, this this is next year's construction yeah. um, that this is going to impact heavily and it's going to change uh, so many economic dy dynamics so many um, architectural dynamics. Um, of, of the way that buildings are built and the types of products that are selected because it is a significant consideration. Yeah, and I think the feedback so far that we've heard, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, not only um, uh, Im implementing um, mechanical code, but also now enforcing it too, from what we're yeah. hearing, being told from our customer base. So. Yeah, so this is going to be, this is a this is really a big one. So if, uh, you know, we've only got a short amount of time, so we can't keep going on this one, but this is one that I would reach out, you know, to, to us or your manufacturer, um, you know, to get get more information on, because it is something that is going to impact a lot of this industry. Yeah, bo bottom dollar for sure. And, 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 the, and the consumers, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another kind of, uh, did you know, I, I think this is more of a, have you spent time thinking about it? But uh, I know it's certainly for me, I've had some VRF experience in, in my past, and I think about the impact of a A2L refrigerant in a traditional VRF system versus perhaps a Friedrich VPAC system. Yeah. And I think when you look at a two ton, which would be a typical floor in a, in a hotel, as an example, uh, a 10 ton VRF system, probably gonna have about 70 pounds of refrigerant wow. in that system. Uh, versus uh, a VPAC, which we're talking 13 rooms, 10 ton equivalent, um, about 30 pounds, 40 pounds of refrigerant, uh, and have, two, two and a half pounds per room. Does that matter, Bill? When and with your customers? tremendously, and and there's also a distinction there. You know, when you have PTACs and VTACs, these are single packaged equipment. So while you might have 10 pounds or 20 pounds in in a floor. They're actually individually packaged, so they're not collect collectively a 70-ton unit. And so what's really important about that, and I think the dynamic of, from a safety perspective and a risk analysis perspective, you're kind of having to, to marry, you know, what's the consequence over, you know, what potentially, you know, could be the severity. Again, a small package unit, whether it's in, you know, a three-room hotel or, you know, a 20-story multifamily building, is going to be inherently safer than having you know, hundreds of tons of refrigerant running through through, uh, through the building. And so, you know, just some key drivers when you look at, you know, when you're building design, and, you know, how does that affect me? And there's really three things, you know, that, that can kind of happen there. I mean, you have one is the space open. So it's, you know, again, when you look at the difference between an office space where you might have a lot of square footage over an inhabited space, you know, like a yeah. hotel or yeah. a multifamily sure. where you're conditioning small spaces, but you have a lot of refrigerant going through. So that, and then what is your ventilation? Like, do you have enough ventilation? If something were to happen, are things going out where they should be? And then finally, where is that, where are those line sets located within the space? Because an a A2L refrigerant is a little denser than other refrigerants, so the higher the, you know, the refrigerant location, the better in a space. So these are things that engineers and architects are now going to have to factor into their building, you know, let alone what we talked about, you know, having the impact for, you know, fire resistant chases and, and more space to run line sets. So, you know, that's why we think from a single package of kind of what Friedrich does, the VTAX and the PTAX and the room air are really going to probably lead some of that change as they try to figure out how does this, you know, large volume VRF type systems impact 
the P-Tax and the V-Tax are probably going to be the short-term solution for some of those buildings. Yeah. And I think you mentioned something there about ventilation. I think you know inherently in the design of these packaged pieces of equipment, we're going through the wall, yeah. right? And if you think about the, the, the refrigerant volume containing pieces of an air conditioning system, compressor, coils, the compressor and, and condenser coil are outside on a PTAC. They're already, they're already outside, vented yeah. to the outside yeah. wall. So there's much less risk of uh, you know, a termination of a unit being inside the living space anyway. So it's already naturally ventilated. And I think that's something that, that, um, you know, that people are considering you know, as, as they think about packaged versus uh, more of the traditional you know, unitary VRF type of solution. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Even in a fire rated chase running to the individual rooms, you're still, I think by code, allowed six feet on each side, right? Outside of the chase, uh, inside and outdoor. But if, if we follow the uh, mechanical code, you still have that exposure. And to Bill's point, there's potential for a lot of refrigerant to be built up under a traditional system versus an in-room solution where you're only talking two and a half pounds. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing, we talk about risk and we talk about, you know, it is mildly flammable and it does have capabilities. Obviously, the larger volume, the more risk it is. But one thing I think it's important to, to note that there's over 100 million air conditioners already in in the marketplace that have A2L refrigerant. As right. CJ mentioned, we've right. been doing it for years. Now, the good kind of the flip side of that is most of them are in the small package variety, right? So right. there's not a lot of, you know, larger volume, you know, uh, you know, uh, input into the market. So, but you know, of those hundred million air conditioners that are already in the marketplace, there really has been zero, you know, loss of life or limb to an ATL, A2L sure. refrigerant. So, you know, it's not all but, the world's going to blow up for yeah, sure. I think it's important that, um, we, that we remind everybody A2Ls are mildly flammable. Mildly. Right? They're, 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 there really could be another category for these to be, you know, yeah. barely flammable if yeah. I were to. <laughs> um, right, so but, but, but I, 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 I think I've witnessed it is. the burn test. I promise it won't explode. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, it will, but, but as we've been flame. talking, there certainly is risk. And I think that's what we're trying to say is, you know, we there's also risk averse decisions, right? So you can make right, decisions absolutely. to use package type equipment or you can make decisions to use, you know, kind of greater, right. greater volume systems. So. I just kind of want to point that out. Yeah, yeah. All, all very good points. So I, I, I think we've uh, kind of covered some of the exposure and risk factors. Uh, the other big topic coming into the booth is tell me about cost. And I think cost is uh, related to us as a manufacturer, but also cost as to what is the impact to my ROI uh, from that perspective. So uh, I'll have TJ talk about manufacturing. Bill, let's talk a little bit about what are your customers expect in terms of overall price and, and cost of construction. Yeah. So, with, so within the units, and I kind of touched on this earlier in the opening. You know, yeah. we have we we are looking at at system changes. The good news for most manufacturers that I've talked to is that we've already made the changes in the chassis. So there's not as significant of capital investment as might be necessary with a major change like this. But we have to. When, when you change the refrigerant, you have to look at every component. And this, you know, here's an example on our slide. Um, you know, you're looking at compressors. So compressor availability is different now, especially because they're the man, many manufacturers are. Uh, um, changing between or deciding between either R32 or R454B, um, so it's not just one harmonization like we've had from R22 to R410. Yeah. So that's also kind of changing what what compressor manufacturers are able to do, and so therefore it's limiting some availability of certain sizes and types of compressors um, because those compressor manufacturers have to decide. And inherently with that, there's a cost impact when you when you split volume to, um, amongst SKUs. So compressors are, are increasing in price. Expansion valve, expansion devices, whether it's a capillary tube or an expansion valve, you know, those are considerations that we that we have to make as well. Okay. Um, the electrical components and and how and, and again U, UL testing and and uh, UL and ETL testing for these devices, you know, they have to now consider the proximity of this flammable refrigerant to other components like electrical components, including electric resistance heaters in a lot of cases. Yeah. So, um, and then the refrigerant charge size. The good news is in a lot of systems, the refrigerant volume can be decreased um, with, with, with a lot of the A2Ls, but we still have to consider the charge size itself. And, and then we get to the point that I brought up earlier is, is it, is it necessary based on that charge volume to have additional safety sensors? Um, and for many types of products, there are. We're very fortunate because of the, the unitized nature of most of Friedrich's products. Absolutely. We do not, we are not burdened with that. Again, same thing that we just talked about with the overall refrigerant volume, um, that it also uh, uh, um, eliminates the need for that because as, as the safety services have seen, there's not a need because based on that lower volume of refrigerant, they do not deem it necessary that, that there's an additional safety piece and also because it's often ventilated to the outside and all those other things that we talked about. So that's what happens in manufacturing and development 
but curious to hear on the, on the, um, the consumer side. Yeah, so I mean, the short answer is probably a good answer from a consumer perspective, is that we haven't seen any major cost or price impacts as it relates to making a change. Um, you know, I think I remember when we, again, going back to the past refrigerant change, when you had some major modifications to uh, condensers and coils from R32, from R, uh, yeah, R2 to 410. Um, from, four, from 410 to 32, we haven't seen any major you know, cost and, and pricing impacts within our products uh, currently. So we've, it's definitely a good sign as it relates to that. And I think that goes back to some of the manufacturing and engineering uh, work that we've done over the last few years to help mitigate uh, any of those increases. Yeah, I think the real impact for you from a consumer perspective, though, is that mechanical code and what do they have to do with the chase, right. Right. which could result in design changes uh, as we look at yeah, typical vertical construct or lodging construction in that vertical. Yeah, yeah and then what you're going to see is that's going to trickle down, right? So if there are buildings that we're planning to utilize, uh, you know, split systems or VRF systems, and now because of this they, they change, well that's going to trickle down. It's going to delay things, it's going to add cost to that project, it will probably change some of the financing dynamics. I mean, there will be a lot of things impacted. Yeah. Um, so, and so I think that's why, why you know, Friedrich especially, we, you know, we've been very upfront, Bill, I know, I know you've had You've, you've had this conversation, you know, uh, countless times with with uh, customers and partners, um, and that you know, you, you getting ahead of this in planning is going to be really key. Knowing when this takes place, when when manufacturers will change over, and when you will only have a 2L product um, available to 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 install, um, it, it's 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 going to be a big deal. Yeah, it is, and and certainly from our big corporate customers, and certainly our big lodging customers, and the TJ, you and I already have some meetings set up. These are the questions that are asking. They want us to answer these questions. Uh, we kind of started off yeah, on this whole conversation, this journey, talking about they're looking to us to help them solve some of those problems, or at least be able to help them explain it, you know, to their owners, their end users, and developers, and what have you. So, um, so, yeah, so we're doing our best to be on the for forefront with that. Outstanding. I think we kind of talked a little bit about this one already, equipment and install cost, TJ, but if you want to just give us a little bit of insight as to Friedrich solutions for in-room sure. and what they mean for yeah. uh, for our and, customers. And, and, and you know, we've, we've talked about this a lot. You know, a lot of what Friedrich does is packaged equipment in-room, and there are a numerous amount of uh, solutions out there. So just because we're talking about a type of product being packaged doesn't mean that you're left with one technology, one form factor even. So, um, you know, at, at, the, at the booth across the hall, Today, you know, we're exhibiting all of these products that you see on the screen, but um, you know, smaller pack, smaller split systems, but as well as a package system. So, we're including PTAX, including variable speed PTAX with the new fresh air, um, but also vertical units. Um, we've got a, a single package vertical heat pumps um, with our single speed, but also our fully variable speed product. And and the great thing is, Bill kind of intimated to is what we've been able to do is man is manage and mitigate those cost impacts on the equipment side to where we can continue to help our, our installation partners and, and, and keep those project costs uh, or project cost changes to a minimum um, with, with very, very little. Um, and, and again, we're, as, we, as we talk to others, we're hearing some similar things, but also some, uh, some that also kind of diverge from that as well. Yeah, so. I, I, I'll take the time to give kudos to our engineering team and the research and design side. The implementation of, a, uh, implementation of A2Ls in our product line, we've seen very little loss in terms of efficiencies, capacities, um, doing a really good job across the board of, of making sure that we're keeping the reliability and the quality that we had with our Fortune products and R32 yeah. uh, as we move forward. So. They, they, did, they, did a, they really did a great job utilizing these years of, of um, of, of having these the A2L the, products in the, the market already, learning, learning room, from it, right? and, yeah. and the smaller, you know, we started with the smallest products, now we're up to our biggest products, yep. um, and, and, and you know, utilizing all that knowledge and technology, so. All right, well, uh, thanks, gentlemen. I appreciate the insight. It's been uh, fun to talk about our uh, in-room solutions as we transition to an A2L, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Kyle here, so Kyle. All right, yeah, thank you, TJ, Jared, Bill, for a great presentation. We certainly have time to address a few online questions. Of course, feel free to submit any questions you have regarding today's presentation in the Q&A and chat tab. Uh, but before we do the uh, questions, I just want to remind you, we'd love your feedback in our post-webinar survey. It uh, helps us improve our program. So if you could uh, fill that out, it'd be greatly appreciated. But we will get to the questions. First one is from Hugh. Is the lodging hospitality in the lodging and hospitality, when is your adoption date? Is it 2025 or 2026?
so the um, the requirement for the manufacturing transition really doesn't change from from one application to another. Um, it's it's mandated by product category. In fact, um, so all, all products you know, that we've talked about today have a requirement of changing um, uh, on December 31st of this year. The by product category, what does change is the ability to sell and install them for di different dates. And most of the lodging, the lodging products that Friedrich manufactures, like P tax, vertical P tax, or B tax, um, that pro that type of equipment. Um, there is a three year sell through, which gives us a window up until the end of 2027. So most of those products now, if you're talking about traditional split systems and other types of products, that is a shorter window. Um, that's where that, that one slide with the bars kind of tried to explain that, that um, there's a one year sell and install through as systems for those. But you can still replace components um, for, for typical split systems. Okay, uh, John's asking here, what will happen with an existing building with multi-units already in a chaseway? So, so I, I've seen this, I've seen a variance of this question pop up through the chat uh, this, this afternoon. Um, so the chaseways and the, 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 the change to the individual line sets in the chaseway has to do with the most recent version of International Mechanical Code, so IMC 2021 which uh, to date, I think seven or 10, something like that, uh, states have adopted. And then more will be on the way as they update their state code. So um, as, as that comes, so that the states um, or municipalities that have adopted IMC 2021 have a requirement that line sets carrying A2L um, refrigerants must be in an individual uh, fire rated chaseway. So, so, it, so if, you're, if you have an existing building, it was it was uh, likely or it should have been built with um, in accordance with the current building code at that time. Um, so my understanding, our our belief, our understanding is that there is no change or no no um, requirement to go backwards in that unless there is a major remodel where it would be um, having to come up to a new current code. And again, that's going to really vary based on the type of um, renovation, retrofit, um, and also the local and state jurisdictions. Yeah, TJ, I would I would add to that answer that um, certainly dependent by state, as you mentioned, uh, and I would refer everybody to the International Code Council website. It's uh, www.iccsafe.org, and you can certainly then look on the Code Council website by state to understand uh, implementation of uh, mechanical code. Uh, it's a great resource to have handy. So, iccsafe.org. Good to know. Uh, from an ASHRAE 15 and 34, how much refrigerant is in a one to two ton unit? Do we have to get into refrigerant monitoring in that they're, they are in the occupied space? For for Friedrich type of unit, so, you know, again, smaller, you know, and a one and a two ton are typically kind of a single room or, or, or you know, one or two room solution. Um, for all the products that we manufacture in that tonnage, we do not have over 64 ounces of refrigerant, so we do not have to get into monitoring um, and things like that, even with our um, uh, the, uh, mini splits with our longest line sets. So um, that, that's that's true for us. I can't necessarily speak for all other brands of equipment, but that should be a pretty good rule of thumb that around that two ton area. Um, but again, uh, uh, you know, th there could be a, a types of equipment that I'm not aware of. Yeah, I think you really nailed it, TJ. Once you get above two ton, you start to get over that 64 ounces, and that creates a, a little bit more stringent on the requirement side. But for us, uh, we'll handle what we need to through sensors and, and be okay. All right, Charles has a question here. Is mechanical noise a concern moving from VRF to VPAC? From VRF to VPAC? Well, um, you know, there, there are, you know, with, with any types of equipment, you know, there are definitely you know sound attenuation things that you can do to really optimize any of them. Um, a, a VTAC piece of equipment can be installed really similarly to a lot of the you know the air moving equipment in a VRF, right? So whether it um, not necessarily you know above head, but but inside a closet like you would if it was a vertical air handler. Um, so you can do a lot to attenuate that sound. So um, I would say it's. I, you know, concern might be too negative of a word, but it's a word, it, you know, it, it's, um, you know, as you, as you choose the proper type of equipment and depending on where and how it will be applied, 
you may or you may want to you know take different attenuation measures and um you know there you know Bill, like you know you may talk you know maybe our our, our examples of the um perimeter return air panel is a, i think a good example. yeah yeah maybe i'll just kind of jump in here a little bit because i actually just had a conversation before this meeting with one of the major brands talking about this very topic which was hey we have vrf design we are thinking about moving to you know a vrp more of a vtac type design and the exact uh question was how does that affect the sound and so to tj's point we kind of walk through the different sound attenuation properties that are available insulated walls insulated access panels um you know insulated ductwork and the different things that you could do to really attenuate that to you know make a package type uh, uh equipment sound very similar to a, you know more of a vrf type system um, so there are a lot of things you can do, you know, with that to make that happen. Good question. All right. Steve is asking for retrofit applications. Will an existing split system replacement require a fire rated chase if the existing doesn't have one? I think we, I I think we covered our, that one already, didn't we, TJ? Yeah. Our, our understanding is that in, in most situations, it will not. What, uh, Ray's asking, what's the actual A2L refrigerant will be used? I, I think you're going to see two major refrigerants. I think most uh, every manufacturer has now announced their plan uh, for 25, and predominantly R454B and R32 will be the two A2L refrigerants that will be uh, making up the majority of, of refrigerant requirements for residential, light commercial, and, and commercial throughout North America. All right, Kevin's asking, since A12 refrigerants are flammable, do we need to provide refrigerant leak detection? If it's over 64 ounces of refrigerant in the equipment, uh, refrigerant leak detection will be required. Um, in our particular case, not because uh, most of Friedrich's equipment um, is under 64 ounces. Maybe a, 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 without without making this a, a an A2L or a mildly flammable refrigerant um, a, a, you know, overall topic. Um, the reason for that is that for for mildly uh, mildly flammable refrigerants, uh, A2Ls like like R32 for those to combust, they need a couple of things. Um, they they need not only a high temperature, so you need you know some some sort of ignition. Um, and it's and it's a very high number. It's uh, I don't know the exact number, seven hundred and thirty degrees or something like that. So more than just a typical flame, um, but also density. Um, so you need a lot of of refrigerant in the same space. And so they so what so you all and, and others have determined that sixty four ounces, um, anything below that, no matter you know what the type of room or space that you might have um, refrigerant going through that does not represent a hazard, a, poten a potential hazard. So that's where they've kind of set that limit. Um, you know, again, you, you could argue, should it be higher um, possibly, but um, that's that's kind of where they've said and they, they believe that to, to, to be right. So that's why there is that limit. And it's not, it's not just any time you have an A2L and no matter what the quantity um, is because of how much of a, the, the, the need for that density of, of refrigerant. Okay, uh, Jose saying, you mentioned already having 100 million A2L units out. When did you start and what units did you produce with A2L? Okay, good question. So I think that the 100 million, I think, was a, <laughs> was a little bit of a mistake. We've had over a million. Um, we actually started in 2014, um, and we started with, and I think Jared mentioned this in the um, in, during the presentation, but we started with some of our smaller window units. So again, starting with the smallest refrigerant volume, um, and then um, we've worked that up to you know some of our very large window units. Um, we've now got P, we now have uh, PTAC units, um, uh, you know, so lot, lots of other types of equipment. And 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 throughout this year, we're we're uh, launching uh, A2Ls and, and all of our types of product. Is it problematic if our state does not have a mechanical code with A2Ls already market available? Uh, 
I, um, I would uh, I would advise you look into that. I think uh, from our tracking of uh, mechanical codes by state, um, almost every state now has passed legislation adopting A2Ls. Uh, there's only a handful of them out that are in kind of the final stages. Uh, so I would encourage you to check uh, once again, uh, just to stay updated on your local uh, state codes as we're seeing, you know, we're pretty good at anticipating that all states uh, will be A2L compliant in terms of state codes, state regulations as we head into December and 1125. <clears throat> right, uh, Steven's asking, if we're doing a change out in the attic, will a fire rated room need to be built around the unit? I don't think I've seen a code that would require that. So, so the, the way that the codes are written, even even with the the chase that, that has kind of become the hot topic, um, that has to do with the line sets as they pass uh, between rooms or floors. And as Jared mentioned, there's there's an allowance for six feet of, ex of I think it's total exposed line set. Uh, six um, feet on I either end. So uh, six feet on either six end. Feet okay, exposed I'm on going, either end. Is the max. The, yep. Yeah, go, going to the equipment itself. So. Um, I, I've not seen any requirement for enclosures in or anything like that around the uh, around the, 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 the air handler. Not around the coil or the air handler. Yep. And that's the intention of the of the leak detection. Josh is asking if they are barely flammable, then why so many safety precautions? I'm guessing an abundance of caution. I, I think yeah, it's an, I, yeah. I think it's an abundance of caution. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, 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 go ahead, TJ. No, go ahead, Jerry. Don't stop. Well, I was I was gonna say when you look at the the refrigerant scale of things, and I, I mentioned it in the webinar, we look at toxicity and flammability is how we rate uh, refrigerants today. And when you consider A two Ls, um, they're low on toxicity and low on flammability, just right above where we are with today's current refrigerants, um, giving us a overall ranking of lower flammability. So while it does exist, it will burn given the right criteria. It's still very loosely flammable, um, but still considered flammable. Yeah, I think I'll add, I'll add one other word that maybe is important too. It's called liability too, right? So you have, you know, some right. from a risk perspective, some liability piece, especially on the engineering and the building side, um, not so much on the manufacturing because you know, it has to get applied, but there is some liability associated with this. So just again, kind of being well informed and making good decisions with that information is really the critical message that we want to want to you know, provide. Hi, right, Mark saying great session, very informative. What A to L training resources do you suggest for technicians, safe use, handling, storage, transport, monitoring, all that stuff? Um, you know, I, I would work closely with your, you know, with your distributors and your various uh, you know, trade organizations, you know, locally that, that you would go through for training. You know, we, we've seen it, you know, especially over the course of the last 18 months. Um, I think, you know, two, three years ago, as this was on the manufacturer's radar, um, there wasn't a lot of people talking about it. But now if you go to, you know, any distributor conference or any um, trade show, you're seeing, you know, this is this is a very hot topic. Um, I know there uh, and, and, and lots of lots of resources available. I think the uh, the various uh, refrigerant manufacturers also have a lot of great training resources, as do tool companies. So, you know, where I would say, you know, wherever you would typically turn for your, you know, your continuing education and your updated training on, on codes and things, I, I would think that they would have, um, you know, great resources uh, available um, for, on the technician side. Kyle, I'll also throw out a promotion for a previous webinar done by the news uh, that you guys did uh, in combination with Friedrich and our parent company, Ream. Uh, I believe that webinar is posted. And as I recall, one of the highest attended webinars that uh, the news has had in some time. So it was a great session. Um, really enjoyed uh, everybody's engagement uh, with us on that too, as well. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for the plug, the check's in the mail. I like it. You're, you're welcome. Um, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> well, next question. What are your thoughts around press fittings for ACR and the shift with flammables? Uh, 
I don't know, Jared, do you have, do you have an opinion uh, on that? Cer- certainly I- press fittings are getting more uh, and more popular in the field. Um, and I think as you look at flammability, uh, certainly being considered by a lot of contractors going to press. Uh, in some ways, I think it also saves them time. Uh, and press fittings have gotten really good. Uh, so I think we'll con- continue to see the adoption of press fittings less on uh, perhaps brazing in the field. But um, at this point in time, um, up really contractor per, uh, uh, perspective and, and what they're doing within their business. So um, I think most manufacturers now uh, are accepting uh, press fittings um, in their IOMs as well. So no, no issues as we move into A2Ls. Can R32 refrigerant be used in place of R410A in existing equipment? Absolutely not. So e- easy answer, uh, diff- different oil, um, not not recommended at all. A um, lot of precautions taking place with uh, A2Ls as well, with sensors, uh, with oils, with filter dryers. So we want to make sure we're doing things correctly. Uh, R410A compressor, uh, not going to run with the R32 or 454B as well. So changes have been made to those components. Uh, for the different uh, variants in refrigerant as well. So uh, it's easy answer, no. Uh, you don't want to drop in 32 in a 410 system. Gotcha. Uh, Devin's asking, what percentage of R32 is in R454B? Is R32 more pure than the R454B? Great question. I'm th- trying to think about what the uh, what the blend is right now. I, it's it's not a secret that uh, all A2L refrigerants are a blend of uh, f- 410, 32, or the key components of those refrigerants. I don't recall exactly off the top of my head uh, the blend from a blend uh, component perspective between 454 and 32. Something we can certainly add in the notes later. Yeah. But, uh, there are some different. Yeah, I, I think R32 is the base or the pure refrigerant, and it's a it's the component of others. R32 is actually a component in R410A, um, but right. but I, I I don't know the makeup of 454 offhand. You can probably look at Camores or one of their sites and get that exactly. Do you anticipate air shipment restrictions for A2Ls? Will that affect lead times and costs for projects in Hawaii Pacific Islands? There, there are already air shipment restrictions in place. So any any equipment with more, greater than 25 pounds of refrigerant is now considered hazardous cargo and is prohibited from air shipment today. So and we'll continue you, to see. You said, you said pounds. Is that right? Is it pounds or ounces? Uh, 25 pounds of refrigerant um, mm-hmm. classifies it as ha- hazardous cargo. Okay, so so smaller we believe could be able well, to ship. Uh, the, the, the current uh, regulation feedback that's coming to us is um, that that A2Ls are not permitted for air freight. Um, we know I, the good clarification, TJ. The twenty five <laughs> pounds per equipment is for um, hazardous transport via um, uh, uh, local transportation. Uh, semi and rail. So yeah. A2L mm-hmm. um, not allowed at all in uh, in air today. Correct. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we're not. Thank we're, you. Thank yeah. you for the, the clarification. Air, air, air shipments we're being told it is right now is not not allowed. Not not allowed. We're not permitted at at this time. Correct. Twenty five okay. pounds. Uh, next question. On, on Twenty five pounds local transportation. Correct. Correct. Gotcha. Next question for Brian. Is there a certification for A2L, something that is added to EPA 608? I, yes, I don't know that it's an add to 608 or a separate one, but there is there is definitely an A2L certification out there. There is, and I'm the same. I can't remember. Okay, we can follow up after the after the webinar, after we look that up. Uh, will there be any sort of alarm or notice for the customer to know if the safety device is dead or not working correctly? 
that that will vary based on the device and the manufacturer. And so the if, if you have a, a very, you know, a smart a, a very smart system with that feedback loop that would feed it to, you know, to the to the wall controller or something like that. Um, it, it does vary though. I I don't believe there is a requirement for that though. So what you'll see is that'll be limited to, to probably the you know upper tier types of equipment or maybe even the larger types of equipment. Yeah, I think it, across the board, it'll just be failure to run. Uh, so notification that uh, of an error code um, and that the system's not going to go into heating or cooling uh, based on the A2L sensor picking up refrigerant leak. That'll shut off all the safeties and prohibit the equipment from running. So, Does the R454B piston size is the same as R410A? Great question. I'm going to have to defer over to our unitary guys for that one. <laughs> I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but yeah. I, I, I do believe they're different. I don't know what the difference in sizes are, though. Okay. No problem. Another one to follow up on there. Uh, you mentioned exposed line set. Is that to the exterior? What about systems that are in attics? Yeah, so it's on either end, six foot exposed on either end, outdoor, six foot on the indoor. Uh, according to the 2021 IMC standard, so you will you you will need to follow that. There's a little caveat, I guess, in terms of mindset of what we think could happen, and you get out of IMC 2021 with uh, with the line set uh, being ran outdoors or the fire rated mechanical chase requirement with most of the line set being ran outdoors. Um, so we are continuing to monitor that development. We'll see how it plays out, but IMC 2021 as it stands today is uh, you are required, if you're going through floors, multi-floor, that, that's probably important for us to point out, multi-floor, uh, so a, a single story residential, different ball game than, than uh, multi-floor, but fire rated mechanical chase, single line set, six foot exposed on either end. All right, Clarence is asking, uh, Houston, Texas is one of the air conditioning capitals of the world. Within the past few weeks, I contacted several local HVC wholesalers and find R32 to not be available at all or in very limited stock and if available, very expensive. When will this change? Uh, good, great, great question. Um, I kind of alluded to this uh, earlier in my, in my response about you know the last couple of years in training. Um, it, it will begin to change probably second half of this year as as more and more of the equipment that utilizes R32 and 454 um, is in is in the market. Um, you know, definitely by the time we change over in you know, you know on January 1st of 25, um, because you know it it will be required when you're you know adding adding charge or re, you know replacing charge um, for any new any new product, but. You know, very similar to the R22 410 change out, you will, my, my, our prediction is that you will kind of see the convergence of those prices and availability. And at some point, 454 availability, oh, sorry, 410 availability will really decrease and prices will go up as well. Yeah, I think 2024, TJ, this is really the it year for the Montreal Protocol and, and the AIM Act, right? So the threshold <laughs> as, as we all start to transition to, a2Ls yeah. in the second half of the year, certainly going to put some pressure on uh, refrigerant manufacturers and equipment manufacturers to make sure that's readily available. And uh, I think you're probably, he says there's limited availability right now. That's probably greatly related to the drawdown um, that we're seeing now. So expect uh, higher stock of A2L refrigerants second half of the year. Uh, what oil are they using for R54 and R32? P uh, it's POE, just like uh, R410A. So same oil, POE. Uh, Noel's asking, what is the basic characteristic of A2L that mandates that it replace R32? Uh, the so the the drive to the A2Ls is about lower GWP global warming potential of the refrigerant. 
So, um, so that that's the requirement, and and refrigerants that have that, that reach those lower levels happen to fall into the A2L category, um, or, or higher, uh, higher on the flammability rating. So, yeah, so the, oh, go ahead, TJ. I was just going to say so that you know there there are definitely I think somebody in mean, one of the questions has mentioned you know the, the use of propane or other other refrigerants which would be highly flammable. Um, Really th those also have a low enough GWP, but obviously, you know, for other reasons, we, we choose not to use them in typical HVAC systems in, in North America. Yeah, so our, our 410A has a GWP of uh, 2088. Uh, A2Ls are 750 or less. Um, so 410 and, uh, excuse me, 32 and 454B are fall in the new classification of 750 or less. And we'll continue to see what the EPA decides to do on the low GWP uh, limit requirements for refrigerant. We think there's, there's at least proposals to continue drawing them down. Some states are now having their own discussions about state drawdowns for low GWP refrigerant. As those continue to progress, that'll continue to drive uh, probably some refrigerant changes. And we'll, we'll see uh, R54B is a little bit less than 32. So we'll see how 32 does as we continue to see drawdowns. Kim is asking, for the three-ton BRP unit, would refrigerant leak detection be provided by Friedrich or field installed? By, by in, in the case of our specific model, the BRP36, it will be provided by Friedrich. All right, next one for Ron. It was stated that 64 ounces for any room size. Is there a, a concern with very small rooms? I, I don't believe so. I think that you all kind of, uh, you know, in looking at those those levels, consider, you know, the smallest possible based on that. So, so we, we believe that they've, you know, that that's, that was taken into consideration. Um, all right, uh, next one from Perry. Can you comment on the difference between refrigerant volume and charge size? Uh, I, I think yeah. we're using them interchangeably. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm sure I, there was a case where that might not be the case. Yeah, I would I would say so as well. Obviously, refrigerant volume. We're thinking about the the um, uh, total amount of refrigerant that could be uh, in an occupied space, uh, and then I think about refrigerant charge. I think about what's necessary within the equipment to to meet the efficiencies overall. So I I think uh, that they sometimes get used interchangeably, but certainly two very different meanings uh, from a from our perspective. Uh, Ray, so when you mentioned A12 refrigerant, what is the ex actual refrigerant that will be used? In, in mo so, it, so for the types of equipment um, you know, that we've talked about today, you know, packaged, unitary, when, you know, we're, we're, as Jared mentioned earlier, we're seeing R32 and R454 being the refrigerants. Um, that, that you know that look like they're going to be production in, in the U.S. Okay, time for uh, one more question uh, from John. Will you still need to flush line sets when going from R410A system to R454B system? Yeah, absolutely. Nit nitrogen is your best friend. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, we'll, we'll get you guys out on that one. You guys uh, answered uh, every question. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, please join me in thanking TJ, Jared, and Bill for their presentation. It was certainly very informative, as well as our sponsor, Friedrich. We really appreciate it. If you have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to click the Email Us button on the console. As you exit today's webinar, please take a couple minutes to complete our survey. We strongly welcome your detailed comments. You can also visit achrnews.com backslash webinars for the archive of this presentation, as well as information about our upcoming events or the archive of the other uh, refrigerant webinar that was teased very properly earlier in this webinar. Uh, we appreciate your time and hope you found this webinar to be a valuable experience. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.